So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. That's my subtitle, everybody. And uh, before we get started on this podcast, I want to say, first of all, thank you for tuning in. Everybody who tunes in, it means a lot to me. I know that you guys are out there doing a lot of things in your life, and the fact that you take a moment or two to tune in and listen to this podcast means a lot to me. So thank you for being here. Uh, If you like what you hear, send it out to your friends and family. We're trying to build a large audience because because the reason is not for me to be more famous or popular or anything. I am building a podcast audience because I want the people that I bring to my show on a weekly basis, every Tuesday, to be heard because these are great people. And today... It is a great pleasure to welcome to my podcast, Jamie Lynn Tatera. Jamie Lynn is a mother of two daughters. She is a author. She's a podcaster, new podcast. We'll talk about that. The name of her podcast, by the way, is called We Are In It Together. Love that name. And she's also an educator. Specifically, she is a mindful and self-compassion educator uh, Jamie Lynn, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to welcome you today to the Hamilton Review. Thank you very much, Dr. Bob. I'm grateful to be here. And you look happy and smiling back there in Michigan. So is life okay back there today? So I'm by Lake Michigan, but actually in Wisconsin. And yes, it's a oh, beautiful day here in, in near Milwaukee. Yes. Sorry, I don't mean to. So Lake Michigan, Milwaukee, okay, near in Wisconsin. Okay, very good. I want to make sure I put you in the right place. So anyway, beautiful. Well, so um, Jamie Lynn, one of the things I like to do is when I have guests, I like them to talk about themselves. And I like if you would be kind enough to start back, go back a little bit in your life and tell us a little bit about where you grew up, the kind of things that uh, your journey, if you will, and how you ended up doing what you're doing today. So I'm going to stop talking, turn the microphone over to you, and let you go. So Jamie Lynn Tatera, you're on. All right, wonderful. Thank you. So I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. All y'all who know about the Green Bay Packers, woot woot. And I, I, we, I had um a lot of, I had two loving parents and uh, three siblings. I had a lot of good things that happened in my childhood, and to be perfectly honest, also some things that were not good that happened in my childhood. So by the time I was a teen, I had a collection of challenges. I had an eating disorder. I had an alcohol addiction issue. I had a lot of a lot of challenges that kind of arose from not knowing how to cope with the difficult things that arose in my life. So hold on. Did you did you say I'm sorry, did I, did I hear you say alcohol addiction? Did you say that? Yes. Yes, that was in my that was it. I had that too. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Keep and going. So sorry. I did, I, they were these these were just kind of um symptoms, if you will, of not knowing how to cope with difficult feelings. And yeah. so I I became a teacher, but before I became a teacher, an elementary educator, that was my first job, I I kind of went through this period where I realized that um, my choices were not aligned with my values. Um, I ended up stopping drinking altogether. And then I ended up realizing I was a, I was kind of an anxious mess underneath it all. Cause I, I think the multiple addictions kept me, kept me going. And so when that yeah. stopped, I kind of realized that I had an anxiety issue. And that led me to getting curious about how does one cultivate well being. And so I, I found yoga. Yoga is really good for my nervous system. But I was one of those people that would do a yoga class. And then you'd lay down in your rest pose. And the teacher would tell you to relax. And I'd lay there tense. <laughs> right? Like, mm. And eventually I found um, mindfulness. And I really liked mindfulness. Because mindfulness didn't tell you to relax. It just told you to be present. And so that... Yeah was a really helpful part of my journey. So then I had I had two resources. By this time now, I'm an elementary school educator and I, I don't have any alcohol addiction issues and I, I do have mindfulness and I do have my yoga practice. But eventually I had my first daughter and 
she had a lot of differences. So when I had my first daughter, she was, she had like her senses were all extra acute, right? She heard more, she saw more. She was a little delayed in her speech and she had big meltdowns. And all of my mindfulness skills didn't seem to be helpful. Mm. So at that juncture, I actually went to see a therapist. It was not my first go around, I mind you, with a therapist, because I thought maybe I was doing something wrong. Like maybe, you know, like I just didn't have the right tool set. And the therapist told me I needed self-compassion. And I thought, huh, what's that? And how does one get it? The therapist wasn't even sure, but um, she just said she knew I needed it. And, and a few, you know, a few months later, I stumbled upon the work of, of Dr. Kristen Neff, who um, her and Dr. Christopher Germer have created a program called Mindful Self-Compassion, flew out to California, yeah. took a training, started teaching that. And then once I became an adult self-compassion teacher, I realized this needs to get to kids. Kids, kids too. To, so yeah. before I get uh, before I get to the getting to the kids, I want to back up a little bit. So what what was the so you were you're talking about as a teenager, you were you found yourself drinking more than you should have. When yeah. when did you begin to kind of dig yourself out of that out of that hole? Because I think you were you obviously you went to high school, you went to, where did you go to college, by the way? I went to UW Madison and it was okay. actually ironically, it was actually, I did a study abroad in Ecuador. Um, Ecuador. Yeah, in in Ecuador. Are you, yep. Ecuador, did you say? Okay. All right. It's, so I went to South America for a study abroad my sophomore year. No, actually it wasn't my junior, my junior year. I was 20 and I had to read a book called Volar Sobre el Pantano, which means um, like kind of fly above the marsh. And it was about alcoholism. And I thought, oh, I have alcoholism. Who knew? Right? So that was a shocker. I knew I had already, I was trying to stop drinking before that with like not very good results. And once I read that book and I realized I actually had a disease, then it it became a lot easier to find the resources I needed to um, to put that into remission. So yeah, it's been over, it's been 26 years now. So that was, uh, but that was what got me there was actually learning about the addictive process and realizing that I had an addiction. Yeah. Yeah. So you you just you you didn't have to go to any kind of therapy for that. You didn't join AA. Nothing. You just stop. You just stop drinking. Well, a kind of interesting fact is that AA is like an anonymous program. So people that are in AA don't actually say that they're in AA because it's like an anonymous program. But let's just say I get by with a little help from my friends. Okay. Yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. So you, okay, so you got through that, and then um, when you were, okay, you were dealing with your daughter, and then you found this mindfulness. First of all, I I want you to, before we start talking about your, your work with children, because I, I, by the way, friends, I, I found uh, Jamie Lynn. Uh, she has written, she's a writer, as I mentioned to you before. She wrote a, an article that was in, in parent, Parenting and Family. It was in, what was it in the magazine before that? It was that, originally though? published in the Greater Good magazine, which is with the UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. Okay, so, but this was maybe an extraction from that. It was entitled Four Habits to Help Children with Social Anxiety. We're going to talk about those four habits in a second. But so you ended up getting into becoming mindful of mindfulness, I guess. Okay. And um, first of all, can you define for this, for our listeners, what mindfulness is? Sure. So mindfulness in a nutshell is noticing what's happening what right now. So you can notice your internal experiences. You can notice your five senses. You can notice your thoughts, your feelings. Um, and it's the, the, the awareness is a non-judgmental awareness. So rather than good, bad, right, wrong, it's like this is what's arising in the moment. So that's kind of pure mindfulness. But truthfully, in real life, we're usually always yeah. judging and assessing. So we can we can be mindful of that, too. So it's, in other words, it's an awareness is what you're saying. It's a mental awareness. And can you give me, like, for example, you're standing in line to go to the theater. Um how do you, how are you mindful? Tell us what, what does that look like when you do that? So, I mean, there's, again, there's so many internal or external aspects you could be mindful of, right? You could be mindful of your environment. 
So noticing the sounds that are happening, the sights that are around you, the smells that are in the room. You could be mindful of your own internal thoughts, right? So there's there's pure mindfulness is when you're just 100% present, right? And it's just flowing through you. But usually we are mindful of something. So I could be mindful of my own impatience. I could be mindful of the peaceful state of my body. I could notice my emotions. I could notice, again, body sensations is actually a very helpful grounding technique. I might notice my feet touching the ground, might notice the clothing on my skin. Again, any, all, or just even one aspect of that would be a piece of mindfulness. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I think that there are, a lot, if we really kind of, I mean, right, even as we're having this conversation, I can, you know, be mindful of your facial expressions. I can be mindful of where you're at in your in your home there. I I also am living here in I mean, I'm here in California. I can hear the, the traffic. There's so many the the mindfulness I think is a um it's a big it's a big it's a big task. <laughs> and you can there are a lot of things you can be mindful of like the the time of the, the ticking away here or whatever. But okay so the, but so basically you kind of you take a second to maybe assess what is in front of you at that moment in time, right? How about or being what mindful? Is inside of you? What is inside of you? So it's both external, but it's also internal. Like they're both, they're both part of our experience. Yeah. And I'm sure that when you talk about mindfulness and I, and I actually don't practice mindfulness by that word. I, I try to be mindful and I also try to be, my, you know, intentional and aware of what's going on around me in, as a general rule. Um, sometimes uh, I'm not sure my wife would agree with that all the time. But um, but that being said, uh, <laughs> that's a joke, baby, if you hear me. Um, anyway, but that being said, I, I think that, you know, this is a uh, to to be at least thoughtful of other people and other things going on. Is, is a very wise thing to do. Um, you have, you have, you, you also went to California or, you, or your therapist told you about what you refer to as self-compassion. Um, so you are an educator in both mindfulness and self-compassion. Tell us about self-compassion. Yeah, so this was the missing piece for me. I, even with mindfulness, I had this tendency to want to, even though it's supposed to be a non-judgmental awareness, but I would want to use it to kind of manipulate change, shift my experience. And I, I kind of had this fix it mentality, both with myself and with my children, right? So if something's wrong, fix it. And what self-compassion taught me how to do was to be with. Something's wrong. I'm so sorry. Can I be yeah. there? with kindness, with myself in that difficult moment. And, and it also can teach us to be strong. There's both a gentle and strong aspect of self-compassion, but the first part I needed was that gentleness of just not trying to make the difficulties go away, but lovingly be with. And there's actually, there's three parts of self-compassion. So there is, and when I teach kids, I, I talk about head, hands extended and hands to heart, right? So hands on head, hands extended, hands on heart. And hands on head is being mindful of Again, compassion, we, we practice when we're struggling, right? So kindness is an everyday moment. Compassion is a, is a difficult moment. It's kindness and difficulty. So mindfulness of, if it's self-compassion, mindfulness of my own struggle, I'm having a hard time. Common humanity is I'm not alone. Every human struggles, right? This is part of the human condition. And then self-kindness. Um, I'm bringing my hands to my heart now. This could be giving myself a kind touch, offering myself some kind words, doing a kind action for myself because I'm having struggle. Yeah. So um, I before our, our conversation began, I'm I'm reading a book about Pascal, and he talks about uh, self love. He he is not a big fan of self love, and so when you talk about self compassion. And self-love. Self-love, he looks at as being more narcissistic. In other words, in turning, in internally loving yourself at the expense of other people. I guess you would say. And and uh, so your your thoughts about that? You're you're not teaching narcissism, is that correct? I am not. I'm not a big fan of narcissism. I'm not an advocate. And and what self-compassion, and sometimes people think that that is a misnomer because it does have the word self in the word. 
Self-compassion doesn't mean me only, it means me too. And so you might even think of, you know, in, in, in different religious traditions, you might hear love your neighbor as yourself, which means yeah. love yourself. You love your neighbor yeah. and you love yourself. And so it's not an or, but I think we live in a culture that teaches either self-indulgence, which is not self-love, or it teaches self-deprecation. And neither yeah. one is treating yourself as, as you would ideally treat your neighbor. Yeah, I mean, by definition, <clears throat> love others as you love yourself. That that is implicitly means that you do love yourself. And I think there's a, as a general rule, people do a mind they're they're you know they're looking out for number one maybe, but it, there it isn't. Uh, you, you, I like the way you put that. It isn't uh, either or. Is it is it, inclusive? It includes yourself. Uh, it doesn't exclude other people and your compassion as well. So. Um, so this is what you teach kids. You're you're out there teaching kids, and you and in particular, your article is entitled Four Habits to Help Children or Kids with Social Anxiety." Um, I want to get into the these different four habits because I think this is important for people listening. But tell us what does social anxiety look like? I, I think I know what it looks like, but I want you to to maybe articulate that to people out there who are wondering what it what it means. Right. Well, and again, social anxiety will look slightly different depending on the child, depending on the age, depending on how it manifests. Oftentimes we flag social anxiety when kids are in their teens or, you know, even, you know, like during the second, the second part during their adolescence. And, and that will look like extreme anxiety, either performing. So there can be performance anxiety or it's, it's anxiety around peers and, and what do my peers think of me? Sometimes kids get so anxious that they're avoiding peer things. They don't go to school, right? So this would be uh, anxiety during the, the teenage years. That particular yeah. article, I actually wrote about social anxiety before it reaches the teenage years. Because again, one of my passions as a resilience educator is how do we give kids skills before it gets to that point? Again, if, you've got, if you're a parent of a teen listening to this podcast, it's not too late. If you're a parent of a child who's not yet a teen, it's not too early. And so when kids are younger, it sometimes can look even like, what do, what do my adults think of me? Am I pleasing enough? Am I good enough? What is my, you know, yeah. just this preoccupation with how am I being perceived? Am I good enough? And then also maybe a reticence to, to try things that are going to make me look like I'm foolish. Right. So like a hyper awareness of how I'm being perceived, because really, ultimately, social anxiety stems from a fear of being negatively perceived by others. Uh, so true. I think that um, I think that social anxiety is something that we all kind of feel. Certainly, I remember being in junior high, high school. Sometimes um, I would remember I would remember that I I felt embarrassed asking questions. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Where, in other words, raising your hand and saying, uh, what is, what does that mean or whatever? I would be looked at by the others in the class as being stupid or, you know, come on, that's obvious. Um, that does inhibit you. Is that not true? Absolutely. Again, if you let it again, that, that presence of social anxiety, and this is what I say too, in the article, it's not the presence or absence that are going to depend, that are going to lead to a certain outcome, it's how do you cope with it? What, yeah. what, what resilience habits or what awarenesses do you bring to that reticence? And depending on how you, how you relate to that, 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 that hesitation, it can either cause you to become more human and connected, or it can cause you to become more anxious and withdrawn. So let's talk about your article. You mentioned, um, for your, these are four habits to help kids. And the first habit is notice and name your feelings, thoughts, and sensations. Can you elaborate on that? Oh, yes. Yeah. So this is our mindfulness here, right? So yep. mindfulness is the first of the four habits. And when I teach kids, I like to use animals to, to teach different resilience habits. And so I have a little giraffe here named Spots. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So I'm, I'm looking, by the way. By the way, this is on YouTube, you guys. You can go watch this on YouTube as well. That is a one cute looking giraffe. Does that giraffe have a name? It's Spots. I'm sorry, what? 
Spots, S P O T S, spots. Spots, okay. All right, spot as appropriately named, okay. So who is spot, that? Spots can help you to spot your, your feelings, thoughts, emotions, and, and body sensations. So becoming aware. I also touch on the, in the article, noticing our feelings habits. This is super helpful. And so in, in a workbook that I'm going to have published in October of 2024, it's the, the Mindfulness and Self-Compassion Workbook for Kids, Volume 1. Okay. I have... Um, we have the what we call feelings habit animals. And so there's four habits that kids and grownups can have with their feelings. So one of them is that of a bear where you explode with feelings, big feelings, high highs, low lows, everything's big. One of them is that of a beaver where you obsess about your feelings, right? Just whoop, 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 spin it around in your head. Another one is a deer where you feel kind of ashamed of having feelings. And the last one is a chameleon. like what feelings do I have, right? So when I work with kids, I don't even know what you're talking about feelings lady, right? So when I work with kids, the first thing I do is I have them take the feelings habit animal quiz to find out what's their animal. And it's amazing how when kids find out what their animal is, they can start to notice their habits with less judgment. And that's what mindfulness is, right? Mindful awareness is noticing what's happening with less judgment. So I kind of start off with, in kids that have social anxiety, they inevitably have the beaver habit of obsessing, and they inevitably have the deer habit of I'm not good enough, right? Um, those are two components of social anxiety is that kind of spinning in the mind and that fear of, of negative perception. So they might have other habits too, but those ones are almost always in the room when you've got a kid that has social anxiety. Unless again, unless they're such a chameleon, they hide things so much that like they're unaware, but even then eventually we, we uncover the other habits. So chameleons are not uh, are something that you really uh, you you shoe chameleons. Is that right? You you try to you try to smoke them out. Is that your goal? Our goal, actually, again, self compassion means we embrace. Yeah. We embrace. So we embrace. We realize again. We take the habits of self compassion. I'm doing the chameleon habit. That's mindful awareness. I'm not alone. There's other chameleons out there. <laughs> And, and what does kindness look like, given that I find emotions so big or so scary that I hide from them? And, and it might look like, you know, kind of working your way around the edges rather than diving right in. So depending on your kids and their habits, you're going to approach, approach this work of mindfulness a little differently. Your second habit is understanding that you are not alone. Yeah, so I call this the buddy habit. And of course, I have another animal. I've got an animal for everything, right? So this animal is a little a little Labrador dog um, named Buddy. And this is actually one of the most helpful habits for kids with social anxiety, is to realize I'm not the only kid that has social anxiety. Because by default, this, this idea of social anxiety is that I am uniquely flawed and it's going to be discovered. And when you realize that like, we're all, we all struggle. It takes some of the shame out of the struggle. And so realizing that everybody has difficult feelings, everybody worries. And again, some kids, depending, if you've got like the super beaver habit, yeah, maybe you're more than average with how much you spin, but you're not alone. And helping kids know that they're not alone, both as a global idea, but also with you as a, if you're a caregiver, right? You're, I'm yeah. here with you. You're not alone. Like, I, like we've got this, to, and we're in this together, right? My podcast, we are in it together, right? Like we are in it together. Helping kids know that is huge for helping them to overcome social anxiety issues. You know what? It's interesting, uh, Jamie Lynn, that as an adult, I, I think it, I've learned this in my, uh, just being, you know, working with people. Uh, we, we are all, you know, you're not alone. They're, that's so true. I mean, there are so many times when you can superficially look at other you know, and we do this, I hate to say it, but we look at other people, we judge, how are they doing? They look like they got the world by the tail. They got, they got this, they got that, they got money, they got friends, they got, you know, they're good looking and all that kind of stuff. And there's a tendency to imagine that they have figured out the, figured out how life is. And yet when you scratch the surface on all of us, you find that there are things that they're worried about. There are there are challenges, there are, there are heartache that everyone has. So I think that concept of being, of, of realizing that 
you know, no one has it totally together. I mean, I think that there are people who who have it more together. <laughs> Certainly in my community, we have a lot of people who are homeless who are walking down the street right next to me here. And they aren't together. I can tell you that. They, they need a lot of help. But there are a lot of people who are driving by in nice cars who who are equally uh, needy. So I love that concept of that you're not alone. I think we can, uh, you know, that when you realize that we're all humans, we all have our fallibilities. There is a certain amount of comfort that I that I derive from that, um, and that's I think what you're trying to uh, share with your kids. Absolutely, and there's a beautiful practice. Actually, I teach it in my parent-child self-compassion class called "Human Just Like Me," and you think of someone else, and then you repeat some phrases like, "This person has a mind and a body just like me." This person sometimes has difficult feelings just like me. And the more we do this, again, it can help help us to internalize this sense of we're all connected. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, the third point you like to make, your third little uh, gift uh, to these kids uh, or habit you like to teach is soothe and encourage yourself with kindness. Okay, so uh, when I think about kindness, I, I think about being... Uh, speaking good words, positive words, uh, maybe touching. You, you you do a lot of touch back there in in uh, Wisconsin. I can see that you're touching yourself a lot. Uh, but <laughs> tell us a bit about soothing and encouraging yourself with kindness. Yeah. So again, I'll, now I'll get I'll get the next animal out. Right. So the next animal. Okay. Is called, you got you got more animals back there. It's and, called and there, Oh my gosh. Okay. Snuggles is the bunny. And so, yes, and notice that it's soothe and encourage. So the soothing aspect is, that's really hard. You know, when a kid is anxious, that is so hard, right? So, so saying to ourselves, that's hard, or saying to yourselves, I care, I love you. Not, not everybody in Wisconsin is touchy, by the way, but self-compassion can be, again, depending on your feelings habit, if you're a chameleon, maybe no touch, but um, it can be, I mean, touch can be a, like, just like babies, right? We soothe babies with kind vocalizations and touch. As grown-ups and kids, we're, we're no different, right? So finding those words that actually give us comfort, you know, and if there's a kind gesture, oftentimes with kids, it's actually like a stuffy, right? Like their their kids are less into giving themselves a kind touch as they are hugging their stuffed animal, right? So that's usually a more accessible thing, but finding comfort because it's hard. And then you'll notice my bunny has a cape. Hey, this says on here, yes. that's snuggles, but there's a little super on the little, the little logo here. So snuggles can also be super snuggles. And super snuggles says, you've got this. You can do hard things. I know you're afraid to raise your hand, but you can raise your hand. Like, I believe in you. And so we can comfort kids both with that gentle, that tender, but also with that strong. And in fact, yeah. that's where sometimes self-compassion is a misnomer because people think self-compassion means, oh, poor baby. Nah. No, it's, like, it's like, oh, sweetie, that is hard. And you can do hard things. That's good. All right. Um, the last habit that you teach these kids is take action and celebrate progress. Um, let's talk about taking action first. What, where, what does that look like? All right, you ready for doodles? I am yeah. ready for doodles. Doodles oh. is the dolphin. Yes, the dolphin, multicolored dolphin. And notice the word doodle starts with the word do. So, um, you know, sometimes we need to take actions on our own behalf. So here, here'd be an example, like a little, a little mini story and social anxiety. So that, that article actually features my younger daughter, who sometimes yep. struggles with social anxiety issues. And um, so today would be a perfect example. Like she was home. She normally has drama on Monday through Thursday, but it's Friday. She had no drama practice. I said, how about you, how about you reach out to a friend and go swimming? Oh, she wasn't so sure. Anyways, we, I, I gently nudged her to, um, to send a little message to a friend to see if the friend could go swimming. Her friend couldn't. And now these friends have a group chat. I'm like, you know, sweet pea, you can put something in the group chat and ask the whole group if any, oh, she wasn't sure. I said, you know what, sweetie, why don't I just write this here for you? And then you can either delete it or send it. And so she looked at it. She added a couple things. She pressed send. One friend was available. They ended up going swimming together. Like she had to move from an idea to an action. And so, you know, in the context of social anxiety, like 
moving forward means you do the hard thing. And sometimes it's baby steps. When kids have a lot of social anxiety, you can actually make kind of like a ladder of, of what does it look like to just do things little by little so that you, we call it a fear facing ladder, but just little by little by little, how do you take the actions that are going to help to liberate you from, from, because again, what, what happens is the fear, the presence or absence of fear is not the issue. It's do you allow the fear to control your actions? And if you do, your social anxiety is going to increase. And if you learn how to face the fear with mindful awareness and self-kindness, your freedom is going to increase. That's very good. Okay, so you take action and the, and after you take action, you celebrate. You celebrate the Celebrate, progress oh my gosh, the last of the resilience habit. It's sunny. Yes, this is the fifth one. So there are five resilience habits. Yeah, you got to soak in the good. So our brains have a natural negativity bias. We naturally focus in on what's wrong and learn from it. That's how we have survived as a species. And so we have to be intentional to say, wait a second, check this out. I took an action and like, look at the other side of this, right? And really help ourselves learn from positive experiences. And that's, those are the five habits that, I mean, they, they apply to, to, to social anxiety, but I wrote another article on obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm going to write another article on self-harming. These same habits apply to any manifestation of, of, you know, mental health challenges that we might have. It's really, it's, they're, yeah. they're foundational skills that you can apply to anything. No, I, I agree. And I, and I, and the, you know, I, I'm thinking about, I'm a pediatrician, obviously, you know that, and I'm thinking about celebrate progress. One of the things I do, uh, Jimmy Lynn, is I, I, at one year of age, I tell parents, I ask parents, I say, how do you, how does it feel to be, have a one-year-old child? And they all universally, they all go, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, I can't believe it's a year and, you know, it's been a quick year. And I said, you remember a year ago when you came here into the, the office the first time and they go, yeah, vividly, they all, they all remember that. And I go, have, has your life changed? And they'll all go, of course. And I go, have you grown personally? And they kind of go, yeah, we have. And I think that sometimes that this idea of celebrating progress, and by the way, it's all usually a very positive thing because they go, yeah, I'm a better person. And, and they'll say that. They will actually articulate, I'm a better person today because I'm less selfish. I am, I'm, learn, I'm more mature. I feel more comfortable with my baby. I'm not as anxious as I was before being a parent. This is all obvious too, because you're a parent to two kids. So you, you, you know what it looks like. Uh, as you look in the rearview mirror, but I do think that it's imp important to reflect from time to time. We don't do this very often, but to reflect the progress we've made. Tell us a little bit about this is all this is all great stuff, by the way. So wonderful. I, the fact that you put this all together. I love your little uh, your little dolls and, and your stuffed toys. And I probably could need a I need some of those, I think, here in California for myself. But uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your podcast, because I know this is something you just started. Yes, I that's right. I just started it. So we've just done a couple episodes. Uh, we are in it together by Jamie Lynn Tatera. I think you have to search it up by Jamie Lynn Tatera, um, T-A-T-E-R-A, J-A-M-I-E-L-Y-N-N. -E um, but it's the first episode was on social anxiety in kids, actually. And the second episode was on obsessive compulsive disorder in kids. The third episode, I'm interviewing Dr. Karen Bluth, who works on self-compassion for teens. The next one's going to be another talking about empathy. So we just look at, we look at challenges and growth opportunities for kids and what resources, that's my, that's my passion, is helping caregivers of kids and kids develop internal resources that can help them to match challenges with resilience. And also to normalize okay. that we all struggle sometimes because, you know, you talked about parents at age one, you know, when they look in the rearview mirror, sometimes parents at age one maybe look back and think, I'm more of a basket case than I was when my child was born. And if that's true for you, you honestly need some kindness. You need to know that you're not alone. Maybe you're struggling with depression and you've gone deeper into it. You need to have a sense of non-judgment. We are in it together and we can get through this, right? We can do yeah. it in community. And so I, the podcast is also designed to help people know whatever your struggle is, you are not alone. We love you and we can do this together. You've also written a book that's coming out this fall, uh, a, a workbook. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, Jamie Lynn Tatera. 
Yes. So all, all of the things that we've talked about today are in that workbook, right? So there's the feelings, habit, animals, right? The bear that explodes with feelings, the chameleon that hides. So that's part of the workbook. It's actually a big adventure. So lots, all these resilient skills, these five resilient skills, um, this volume one and volume two. So volume one is coming out in October of 2024. Um, volume two will come out in 2025 and it builds, they build on each other. So all of the resilient skills are there on like kind of a foundational level in the first workbook, which is, and we're, it's done through fun. So like some serious skills, but the whole thing is playful. So the, this doodles, the dolphin is going to be 10 years old, never had a birthday party. Seriously. So the kids are going on this big quest and the quest spans both books and every adventure, they gather ingredients for this magical birthday cake for the surprise party for the dolphin. Um, now adults, you don't get this for kids. This birthday party matters. Like I've been teaching this in schools and we get done with the first workbook and the kids are like, what's next? Like we didn't do the, we didn't do the birthday party yet. So um, it's done in a very playful way and all of the content is super engaging, but kids are learning the foundations of mindfulness and self-compassion in the, it's called the mindfulness and self-compassion workbook for kids. That's volume one this year and next year, volume two. So you are a resourceful and very, very ambitious uh, young lady. I can tell you that. I'm, I'm kind of blown away by all the things you're doing, but it's good stuff. And uh, let, let me ask you a question, uh, Jamie Lynn, how do people find you out there? So I have a website, jamielintatera.com. So that'd be a good place to go. You can get my newsletter. I highly recommend my newsletter because then you'll get weekly tips about how to help kids grow resilience and how to help yourself grow resilience. I also do adult education because one of the best ways we can help kids learn these skills is to learn them ourselves. And if you're listening to this podcast right now and you think, oh my gosh, I don't do these things. I beat myself up. I'm super self-critical. I'm a perfectionist. You're not alone. This is where you start. And in fact, the more you can use these habits with yourself and even name it to your children, you know what? Like, I think I've got a little issue with perfectionism here. Or I noticed I have a really, I have this voice in my head that's unkind to me. I'm going to start growing another voice. This doesn't have to be the only voice in my head. So again, I do adult education too, because when caregivers have it and caregivers model it, kids take it in. Kids take it in too. All right, friends, Jamie Lynn Tatera, T-A-T-E-R-A. -E you can find her on the web. Uh, you're doing a lot of good work, my my friend, and I I, I want to applaud what you're doing. Uh, God bless you for what you do. So, friends, uh, so thank you for being here today, Jamie Lynn. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bob, for for having me. It's been a pleasure. And friends, thank you for tuning in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Until next time, be well, be safe. Bye bye. You have been listening to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.